Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. And he's Lord whether we believe it or not. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I'm, I want to continue. If you were here the last few times I've taught, my title is Practicing Real Love. Practicing Real Love. So I'm going to go ahead and continue in uh, tonight's lesson. We'll see how far we get. I never know. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and continue in tonight's lesson. It's going to be Practicing Real Love. This might be part three or four. I can't remember. But it's practicing real love. I will encourage you, as I always do, if you did not listen to the previous lessons, I would encourage you to, to get the CDs um, because every time I've taught, you know, Holy Spirit, because he's in charge, there's a different emphasis, there's different things that he says, and, you know, each lesson is building upon the last one. So I would encourage you to uh, go ahead and get the lesson. Um, let's go ahead and look at our, um, our foundation scripture tonight. Uh, the first one we're going to look at, and again, we're talking about practicing real love. Let's go to 1 John, 1 John, the third chapter. And we're going to look at verses 18 and 19. 1 John, the third chapter, verses 18 through 19. I'm sorry, verses 18 through 20, and I'm going to read this out of the message translation of the Bible, the message translation, and it says, my dear children, let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we are living truly, living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut down the debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about, uh, more about us than we do ourselves. So listen to what he said. He says, let's not just talk about love, let's practice it. How many of y'all know, how many of y'all have heard that term back in the day, talk is cheap? Yeah. Right? Well, see, that's how it is in the body of Christ. And I really believe that we in the body of Christ have to get that. You know, we can tell people we love them, but does your action show that? And how do you know what real love is? Um, you know, Pastor was talking last week when he was get, um, starting his uh, le uh, lesson on um, parenting. You know, you know, what you believe is based on your background. And, you know, based upon your background, your life experiences, what brought you to this very point. When you come into the body of Christ, we always think we know love, but we really don't uh, know love. And so we have to come in with that um, attitude of humility to really hear what what the word of God says love is, because love isn't what we think it is. I, I, I learned that a long time ago. What I thought love was, God just tore that whole thing up for me when I came here. Because the word God says one thing, and I think it says something different. Uh, let, me look at, let me also look at the TLB version of the Bible, the Living Translation of the Bible. And it says, little, little children, let us stop just saying we love people. Let us really love them and show it by our actions. Then we will know for sure our actions that we are on God's side and our consciences will be clear even when we stand before the Lord. And I'll read one more translation, uh, the Amplified Translation of the Bible. In verse 18 it says, Little children, let us not love merely in theory or in speech, but in deed and in truth in practice and in sincerity. See, a lot of people talk about love. You know, they want to give you their philosophy and their theory about what they think is love is, but at the end of the day, God's looking at what kind of fruit are you producing in your life. That's what he's looking at. See, how are you treating people? What matters most to God is people, not things. Things are fine, but at the end of the day, what God is looking at is how do we treat one another? And let's look at John, the 13th chapter. John, the 13th chapter. And in John, the 13th chapter, I'm going to look at, uh, out of the NLT version of the Bible, I'm going to look at verses 34 and 35, John, the 13th. And again, this is just foundation scripture. So now this is Jesus talking. In the NLT version, 34, he says, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you. You should love each other. How many of y'all know when God tells you to do something, he gives you the ability to do it? So we can't go before God and say, Lord, I couldn't do it. He ain't trying to hear it. So he says, 
Just as, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Verse 35 is key. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world. See, it's the world that we have to prove something to. Amen. See, because when Christians, and I really don't like using that term, but I'll use it just for, this, for the example. When Christians, those who are born again in the body of Christ, act like the world, what are we proving to them? Amen. See, I'm not upset when I hear that a lot of people don't want to come to church because, and what I mean by that is that, you know, you got people in the, on the outside looking at the lives of those that are in the body of Christ, looking at their lives and saying, I want nothing to do with the church. Yeah. So I understand. I might not, I mean, obviously I know I'm believing for them to come into the body, but see, when we get right, they'll, they'll get right. Amen. So verse 35, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I believe sometimes in the body of Christ, we kind of, you know, we get things mixed up. I mean, I'm all for going out and evangelizing. Obviously, that's a part of, you know, that's our assignment, and that's fine. That's good and all, and that is not to be taken lightly. We all need to do it, but what will but we'll, we'll impact people more is how you live. Yeah, how you live. Ask me how I know. I've been doing this same thing for almost 18, 19 years, and I've seen how God has touched people in my family's life when they came out of certain conditions and they would say when I first got in, ain't no, uh, ain't no way I'm going to um, look at the word, see what the word says and change my life. And I can tell you because I took the word of God seriously because of the excellent teaching here, people's lives are changed today. And that's not me boasting in me. That's bo uh, boasting in the truth of God's word. Amen. Amen. And let me look at this uh, out of the Amplified translation and then we'll go ahead and get into tonight's lesson. John 13, verse 34 and 35, he says, I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I've loved you. So you should also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, if you keep on showing love among yourselves. See, that's key. See, in the world, natural affection, I'm going to love you as long as you don't do something wrong. I mean, we're good to go. You don't even have to worry about it. But as soon as you do something and I take offense, I'm going to cut you off, right? That's the attitude of the world, right? But over here, he said, they're going to know you, my disciples, because you continue to love one another. See, the implication is you're going to continue because, see, something's going to happen along the way. When you get born again, you know, you're not floating on clouds, you know, we like to think people who don't know any better that they're naive, you think that once you get born again, everything's going to be all right. And the truth of the matter, everything ain't going to be all right. It's only going to be all right if you work in the word in your life. Amen. And see, along the way, you're going to have challenges. But we have to learn how to love one another. Continue to learn to love one another. Whether that's in our homes, in the local church that you're uh, connected to on your job, we have to set the example. We cannot come at each other like the world comes at each other. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So the last time we were together, <clears throat> I want to give you a, qu a, qu a quick recap, and then we'll uh, get over to where I want to get to tonight. Um, what I did was I, I, gave you, I gave you a few things regarding keys to being effective and practicing real love. So I talked about counting the cost. You know, Jesus said himself, he says, before you do anything, count the cost. And so before you begin to really practice real love or continue in it, you got to count the cost. And this is not just a one-time thing. This is something that you need to revisit often because every day you're going to be challenged in some respect with someone. It could be in your home, husband and wife, or parents and children. It could be on your job because you know on your job you got some characters, right? It could be, you know, it could be in the local church, especially if you get into leadership, yeah. especially if you get into leadership, because, see, you're going to come to a revelation, and that revelation is none of us are perfect. Amen. You know, we're all imperfect people striving to continue to mature together, and so you got to you got to understand that counting the cost is very important, because, see, once you count the cost and you know what's involved, then you're more likely to go through with it. Amen. So one of the things I talked about was you want to count the cost. One of the costs is uh, it's going to cost us our comfort zone. 
it's going to cost us, cost us our comfort zone. And I'm not going to go to the scripture, but what I said was this. When we are being challenged to love one another, Satan will flood our mind with fleshly thoughts to lead us back to our emotional place of comfort, promoting the idea that our emotional comfort zone is a place of protection. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Someone does something that you don't like, and so the first thing we want to do is move away from them. Because, see, if I move away from you, then I don't got to deal with you. Because, see, every time I see your face, I get angry. I know I'm not the only one that hasn't been saved all their life. You know what I'm talking about. But, see, that's the trick of the adversary because God needs us to grow. And so get, com get comfortable being uncomfortable. So when we allow God to develop to see the love in us through the various trials and tests in our life, the love of God will stretch us beyond our, nat our natural emotional place of comfort. That's why Jesus, when, when the man said that, you know, he was all gung-ho for Jesus, and he was like, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus looked at him, and he said, are you ready to rough it? He said, see, the man was thinking about where he would follow him physically, like, in other words, geographically. But Jesus was talking about where you're going to follow him spiritually. Because he, he said, foxes have holes and birds have a nest, but the Son of Man has no place to rest, it, rest his head. In other words, the hole for the fox and the nest for the bird was simply a place of comfort. comfort because where are we most comfortable? In our homes. And he said, the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. You rest your head at night, you lay your head on a pillow, what's that to depict? Comfort. So Jesus is letting you know that, listen, when you follow me in a way of love, my love is going to stretch you beyond what your flesh may like or dislike. As the word of God says we're supposed to be conformed into the image of Christ, right? The word also says in scripture that God is the potter and we're the clay. And so when he takes us, when we come into the body of Christ, we're not a finished product. He's going to conform us. So that means the clay has to be stretched and pulled in directions that it really don't want to go. Well, see, I'm the one that said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Yeah. So now if that's what we're telling him, and that's the commitment we made, understand that it's going to cost you your comfort zone. Amen? The second thing we looked at after comfort zone is that it's going to cost you your loyalty to people. Mm, that's, a, that's a big one right there. It's going to cost you your loyalty to people. Now, this includes our family, friends, ethnic groups, genders, political parties, and even ourselves. When we are born again and become citizens of the kingdom, our greatest sense of loyalty is now expected to shift to our king, Jesus Christ. In our daily lives, we are expected to make daily decisions reflecting the greater sense of allegiance to the word of God versus the people that we are emotionally tied to. It's rough right here. You know, because see, when the word of God grabs a hold of you and, you know, mama and them want you doing things that you ain't supposed to be doing, like coming over your house and drinking and smoking, and you understand that the Lord bless you with the house, what you going to do? You going to compromise the word for them? That's why in scripture when they said, you, when they told Jesus, they said, you know, your mama's outside or whatever, and I'm just paraphrasing. You know, he said, he said, obedience to God is thicker than blood. You ever heard that phrase that blood is thicker than water? In other words, you know, your greatest sense of loyalty is to your family, and they could be just as wrong as two left shoes, but you're going to go with them. Not so in the body of Christ. If they wrong, they wrong. You just call a spade a spade. Now, grace of God's there. You can love on them, but you do not, you do not compromise the word of God for anybody. That includes your spouse. I'll say that again. That includes your spouse. That includes your child. That includes your family, your brother, your sister, your mama. I don't care who it is. Your loyalty is to God. See, this is what it's going to cost you if you're going to really allow God to develop you. Amen? So it's going to cost you your loyalty to people. Therefore, it's also going to cost you your popularity with people. You're not going to be popular. I mean, if you look at the condition of this world and you think about some of the stuff that's going on and you stand and you make a public declaration, you know, if the Lord led you or whatever, and you said, you know, and you say something like, no, nah, I don't believe in same-sex marriage. You know, Twitter, 
Facebookers. A lot of people are going to be hating on you. But see, can you do it for the Lord? As the Spirit of God leads you. I was listening to, uh, watching a video the other day, and they, they had this, you know, praying for this uh, pastor. He was, uh, he was being interviewed because at one time he has a, a son of his. Um, he was being interviewed, and, and they had asked him over the course of years, like, where he stood as far as same-sex marriage and all that stuff. And, of course, he always stood for what the Word said. He was like, well, hey, look, I believe this is what the Word of God says, you know, man and wife, blah, blah, blah. Then he found out, like, when his son turned 18, 19, that his son, you know, believed that he was, you know, supposed to be with, with another male. And so then they came back, and they revisited it, and they asked him, because he, when he began to teach from the pulpit, his stance changed. And then all of a sudden he said, when they asked him, when the church council, whatever you want to call it, asked him, why would you change your stance? He said, because I got a revelation from God. Now, it sounds funny, but it's happening all over the place. See, he had a greater sense of loyalty to his son than he did the word. It happens. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen people in sports and sports arena, people that I, you know, enjoy watching as far as, you know, sports, football and stuff like that. And I've seen them take stance and they compromise the word. And I pray for them, you know, but they'll say things like, I neither condone nor I condemn. What? Can you say that again? Because I'm not understanding you. I neither condone or I condemn. Which one is it? Now, you don't condemn the person, you understand, because we understand we're not there to condemn the person. But, I mean, how do you, with God, there is no gray area. See, he needs to know where you stand. Yeah. Scripture says, you know, God, you know, he likes some people e either hot or cold, but if you lukewarm, warm, he's going to spit you out. But, of course, with them, you know, again, because money's driving you, they don't want to leave, uh, they don't want to lose that money. You know, because now it's affecting their pocketbook. But see, if I know God's my source, what do I care? So these are the, I'm just giving you examples in the world, stuff that's going on. But, but this is happening in the body. Not outside the body. Well, outside the body, I already understand what their nature is. You know, we pray for them genuinely. But I'm saying in the body, this is what's going on. And so God brought you to a, a, a local church like this where he's given you a man of God who will uncompromisingly teach the word. So that you can really develop and become all that God wants you to be. Amen? Amen. So we talked about a few things um, concerning cost. So now turn with me to Psalm 127. Because I want to move forward to tonight. I want to get, get, uh, go over into a different area. 127. So we're going to build, a, we're gonna build upon counting the cost. So now that you know what the cost is, <clears throat> get ready to be con uh, uncomfortable. Praise the Lord. Psalm 127, I'm going to read this out of the NLT, and then I want to read this out of the message translation. Now, um, you know, 1 Corinthians, to set this up, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, says that we are God's house, God's building, right? In Psalm 127, the NLT says that unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. So in other words, unless God is building me, now how does God build us? Through his word, Right? It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is wasted. Let me read this out of the message. I love the message. It says, if God doesn't build the house, the builders are only building shacks. Isn't that good? That unless God is building the house, or unless God is establishing you through the word, you only build in the shack. So my question you, to you tonight, and I want you to think about this, is, is are you a shack of love or a house of love? Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just obeying Holy Spirit. Forget what people think. In the eyes of God, am I a shack of love or am I a house of love? If I'm a house of love, then I'm going to allow God to build me through the word. You know, but, you know, when you're a shack of love, you'll do things like say, I'm all for transgender. I'm just giving you something, you know, that y'all can relate to. You know, I, I'm for that. I'm, I'm for same-sex, uh, you know, same-sex marriages. I'm for, 
same-sex uh, bathrooms and all that kind of mess. But when you're a house of love, you don't compromise. So now with that said, I told you it's going to get a, a, uncomfortable, right? If we're going to practice real love, be a house of love and not a shack, we have to understand the importance of confrontation and correction. See, this is where it gets, gets a little rough. You know, if you know the word and you're sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, you'll know that in the last several years, there is this idea going around in the body. I'm not talking about outside the body. I'm talking about in the body. There is this idea going around in the body as though God is doing a new thing in the church in a way of love. And what I mean by that is if you've ever heard, and there's no, there is nothing wrong with the message of grace, right? But now who teaches it and who listens to it is a different story. And the idea that's going around, it's, it, the idea that's being pushed is that what God is doing, which he's not, is that the way we're going to love people is through encouragement and encouragement alone while disregarding the value and the idea of correction. That's why you got people like in mega churches, you know, you got sports people that are, you know, sports entertainment industry. They're attached to these large churches and they'll go there and then they'll, they'll say, I've seen it all over the place. And they'll, and they'll say, well, this is how a church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be encouraging people all the time. And let me say this. Ain't nothing wrong with encouragement. Praise the Lord for it. In fact, let me just say this because I know how the adversary works, especially when it comes to subjects like this. I'm all for encouragement. If you know me and you've ever been around me and you've had a one-on-one -on -one interaction with me, I will encourage you every chance I get because I love people. But I will also confront you, be as wise as a serpent, as harmless as a dove, but I will confront you and I will address you if there is an error in your thinking. So this idea that's going around as though it's all about encouragement, and encouragement is good, I'll say it again, nothing wrong with encouragement, but the way that you're going to get people to where they want to go is through encouragement, and you disregard the value of correction, that's unscriptural. And I'm saying this because we want to make sure that your head's not in the sand. Now, are you going to be a shack of love or a house of love? House of love, right? Praise the Lord. So now watch this. Let's go to Proverbs, the 13th chapter. Proverbs, the 13th chapter. And I'm going to read verse 24 out of the message translation of the Bible. Notice what it says. A refusal to correct is a refusal to love. Message translation. A refusal to correct is a refusal to love. So now how is it that God is pushing this idea that it's all about encouragement and you disregard correction when correction is needed house of love or shack of love see which one are you going to take no because see what happens is and see most of the time if we're honest with ourselves most people that just want to be encouraged and don't want to receive godly correction or confrontation is because something has happened at some point in your life or stages throughout your life to where you want to deal with a confrontation because someone has offended you. You got to look real hard at yourself, real hard. And then, you know, the word of God says that faith comes by hearing, right? And so now if I'm taking on this message that it's all about encouragement and it ain't about correction, who are you listening to? Faith comes by hearing, right? And it's obvious that you must be listening to people that are offended. Wow. 
can't get away from foundation. So now, once again, you counted the cost. Where's your loyalty? Is it to the people? Are you so emotionally attached to the people that you can't tell them straight? Yeah, because, see, that's confrontation. Now, i got to say this because people say, oh, yeah, we're just going to tell them off. You can't do that. God is a God of mercy and grace. i got to say that because even though I know that, you might not. You can't just talk to people any kind of way. You know, people, I'm just going to say whatever I'm going to say. I'm just going to speak the truth. Word says speaking the truth in love. Now let me flip the script on you. How does God speak to you? When you mess it. And you know you mess it from time to time. You're going before a, th a throne of grace and mercy. Not judgment. So you can't talk to people any kind of way. But you got to be able to tell, you, you got to be able to call a spade a spade. You got to be able to call sin for what it is. It, you know, it grieves my, and I understand, I pray for those, you know, I pray for these men and women, women of God that I hear, uh, that, you know, that I hear things when, when I'm watching online or whatever, but I hear where they're getting interviewed and I'm just like, go ahead, you know, give the word. And they'll ask them a question and they skate around it. They don't call it for what it is. Well, you know, I just believe this. I'm like, okay, what you believe? What you believe? Tell them. Tell them. In my, in my spirit, I'm like, tell them. You know, be gentle about it, but tell them. They just say, well, you know, well, you know, I'm just going to leave that one alone because everyone's going to know and find out for themselves. Really? I, I heard this, this, this young lady, I'm not going to say her name, but somebody I, was, uh, I used to listen to as far as praise and worship. Beautiful voice. And uh, she had currently... She had just recently, in the last few months, she had gotten some crossover appeal in the music industry. So, you know, she said she was going to go into, she was going to go into the world because she, she said that the Lord told her to go. And, um, hey, pray, that's between her and the Lord. I'm not getting over into what the Holy Spirit told you didn't tell you. We're going to find out. And um, she said that the Lord told her to do it. And then one day she was on the radio station and they were interviewing her. And they said, well, what do you think about? Uh, what do you think about the whole topic? Because, you know, you're appealing to a lot of people. What do you think about, you know, same-sex marriage? She was just like, uh, I can't say. And they're like, well, I mean, it is or it isn't. She said, I have too many. Now, listen to what she said. She said, I have too many friends that I know that I don't want to hurt. That's counterfeit love. Because, see, if I see you going down the street and I know that there's destruction, if you love me, you're going to say something. But she couldn't say it. Now, I'm not condemning her. I, I pray for her. Lord knows I was praying for her because, I mean, she's, she has a sphere of influence. But, see, we've gotten this false idea. Praise the Lord. I'm going a little different than I thought. We've gotten this false idea on gentleness. See, and, and I've watched videos on her where, you know, she has a very sweet spirit, you know, very sweet spirit. And she's, she's all about, in her eyes, being gentle. Biblical gentleness doesn't, doesn't, it does not not call sin, sin. Our greatest example is Jesus, right? He's a man. I think about when the woman was caught committing adultery and they were about to stone her. And what happened? Jesus said, he who has not sinned, cast the first stone, right? He went right up to her, and he said, sin no more. He said, I've forgiven you, sin no more. Now, he still called sin, sin. He didn't say, you didn't sin. He didn't say, oh, uh, you know. No, he said sin was sin, but he was gentle. But in biblical gentleness, you still call sin, sin. But this is what's happening. But listen, the word of God says, now, so, now, he, and here's the thing. And there's something else I was thinking about in Revelations. In Revelations, if, and I, I know it's not true, where they say that, you know, God is doing a new thing in terms of love and going toward encouragement and doing away with correction. If that was the case, then why would Jesus say in the book of Revelations, which is the future, that I correct those whom, whom I love? Why would he go to the different churches and tell them to repent? I thought he was doing a new thing. Now he's going back to an old thing. 
Which one is it? We got to think. Right? We got to think. So listen, let, turn with me. Turn with me. I want to look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. And we're going to look at the fourth chapter. I'm just laying the foundation for this for confrontation and correction. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 4. And I'm going to read this out of the CEV version of the Bible. And it says, when Christ Jesus comes as king, he will be the judge of everyone, whether they are living or dead. So with God in Christ's witness, I command you to preach God's message. Whose message? God's message. To preach God's message. Do it willingly, even if it isn't popular. Even if it isn't popular. See, I know why sometimes people come here and they run. Because the full counsel of God's word comes forth. You're going to get encouragement. You're going to get correction. You're going to get whatever it is that you need. And see, and you can always tell when people have um, gravitated towards that devilish idea that it's all about encouragement. Because they'll say things like this. And, you know, obviously check yourself out. Well, you know, you know, once you've accepted that idea, you'll say things like, you know what? I'm just going to encourage people. That's all I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to focus on. That's how God's wired me. I don't want to have to confront no one. That's just what I'm going to do. Let me just say something about that. Praise the Lord. Jesus is our example, right? Love of God personified. He said, I only do and say what my father says. So in other words, it's not about what we want. It's about what God wants. So it's not about encouragement versus correction as though, you know, because we got the correction camp and then we got the encouragement camp. The word of God's all about balance. The only camp that we should be in is the Jesus camp. And we need to be about what we need to be about when God tells us to be about it. And there are going to be times when it's going to call for correction. There's going to be times when it calls for encouragement. We just have to listen to God to find out what we need to do in that situation. But see, when we begin to disregard an aspect of the love of Christ, we're disregarding God himself because we think we know what we need. You know, I need encouragement. I don't need that correction. That's, I mean, that's how we act, right? Man, it's like my son, right? Look, praise the Lord. Five years old, right? It's up to him. He wakes up every morning he like this. Daddy, mommy. Can I have some chocolate, please? <laughs> you know, he, he looking at he's like, can I have some chocolate, some candy? Listen, that's what he thinks he needs. But we know as his parents what he needs. That's what he wants. But as his parents, we know what he needs. How much more does God in heaven know what we need? I'm telling you, the reason why we get toward that side where we're all about the encouragement and that's it is because we're offended about something, and there's something in my heart that ain't right, in my own heart. I know, I know, I know it's, it's a hard message. Sometimes I ask the Lord, like, Lord, why, why you got to make, make me say this stuff? <laughs> That's all right, though. He knows I'll say it. You know, uh, Kenneth Hagin, um, awesome man of God, he has a book in the bookstore. We, we tell the um, foundation people to get it. It's called Growing Up Spiritually. And he, he, gives a, he, he gives a great example of how there's a, a great parallel between physical growth and spiritual growth. How you have, you know, you have your, um, you have infancy, and then, you know, you have the adolescent or whatever, and then you got manhood. Now, all of us who are parents already know it is impossible. And, you know, I, I don't like to use that word impossible a lot, especially when it comes to the word of God. But, listen, it is impossible to raise a child from infancy to manhood without correction. That's right. So when you get born again, you are a spiritual babe in Christ. It is impossible to go from being a babe in Christ to who God wants you to be in Christ, which is Jesus himself, right? Because he is our example. It is impossible to do it without correction. 
So I'm, I'm saying this because, see, when you hear people talking to you like that, it's your time to run. No, I mean, depending on where you are. I mean, you can confront them, but I don't know where you're at. But you might need to confront them. But I'm telling you, that is a devilish thought that's going on in the body. People think that there's a new way to love, and there ain't no new way to love. God knew what he was doing from the beginning. He's just showing man. Now, as far as new way of love, the new way of love was when Jesus came on the scene. Because man was loving naturally. So Jesus came on the scene to show agape. And then when he showed the way, then he gave you the ability to do it when you accept Jesus. Because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. So God ain't doing nothing new with love. People are going in a diff different direction because of an offense. Okay. You know what's interesting? I was, um, and I shared this with the youth when we were teaching. We were talking about confrontation. If you look up the definition for confrontation, like on, you know, whatever, Webster, Dictionary, whatever, this is the world's definition. And this is why we have to make sure we're practicing agape. The world's definition, you can look it up online, it is a hostile and argumentative meeting between two opposing parties. It is hostile. Hostile. You think that's how God wants us to come at each other? Christians do it, though. Listen, let me just, let me say this biblical confrontation and correction, all right? Biblical confrontation and correction is an expression of God's divine love that is essential to our growth process. You can just listen. You don't have to write it down, get the CD. Biblical confrontation and correction is an expression of God's divine love that is essential to our growth process. The purpose is to address the error of a person's thinking that is preventing them from walking in the will of God. The purpose is to address the error of their thinking that is preventing them from walking in the will of God. So, the goal of confrontation and correction is repentance. That's my goal. I'm not coming to you to tell you how much you hurt me. There has to be a shift in our thinking. I'm not here to magnify my hurt and how, just how bad you are. My goal is to get you to repent. Right? So watch this. So the result of uh, confrontation and correction is deliverance when received. So in other words, when we have situations where we might have to confront one another and that person is humble enough to receive what's being said, the, the result is deliverance. I'll give you scriptural references for all this. I'm just setting it up. So when a person has received godly correction, it frees them from the devil's trap set up in their mind, which has stopped them from walking in God's will. Second Timothy, second chapter, verse 26. So more importantly, though, confrontation and correction should always be done in humility, motivated, watch this, by our love for God and our love for the person. See, uh, there's, I mean, if you've been in the body of Christ any length of time, there's always been confrontation and correction going on. The problem is it hadn't been done in the right spirit. Wrong spirit. No patience, no gentleness. I'm going to talk to you like I want to talk to you. I'm coming in to magnify me. Now, if I'm here to magnify the Father, because that's what Jesus said, right? then shouldn't my confrontation toward you, because my expectation is that you're going to repent, shouldn't my attitude, the spirit in which I'm projecting, shouldn't it be forgiveness? Shouldn't you hear that in my, in, in my demeanor, in my, in, 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 in my body language? Shouldn't you see it? Shouldn't you see grace and mercy? See, the problem is when we go into confrontation, we still think it like the world. I'm here to tell you just how much you missed it. Versus just to, hey, be like, you know, just to get into the conversation and bring the truth, bring the word of God. Let the person know where they missed it, but love them, already forgave them. See, it's the attitude in which we do it where we're missing it. Most people, they confront. It's just an attitude thing. And then people don't want to, you know, be associated with you or whatever because attitude thing. 
But listen, <clears throat> correction, there is value in going beyond encouragement, but also correction, confrontation and correction. I'll give you an example about how important it is that you confront the error of someone's thinking. The Lord brought this back to my remembrance this morning as I was studying. Um, several years ago when I was uh, working in the hotel industry, I was on my lunch break one time, and uh, I had already worked at that hotel there for about a year or whatever. And um, I was on my lunch break, and of course, when I'm eating, I really don't want to talk a whole lot. Um, I want to eat because my break was short. And um, I sat down, and I was eating, and then like three or four of my coworkers came, and they sat down next to me. And uh, they started talking about this lady's situation where her, uh, she had a son, and he was like, 15, 16, somewhere around there, and she had just found out that he was having sex, right? And so she, you know, so she goes on to tell her, you know, the friends what was going on, and uh, then she, she kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I, and I'm eating, and I'm thinking, Lord, please don't. Like, you know, you ever been in school, and the teacher about to call on you, and everyone know it, like, you know, and on your <laughs> face, you're just like, Lord, please, don't call me, don't call me, and then they call your name. Right? That's how I felt at the time. I was like sitting there and I knew they were going to call me. I knew she was going to say something to me. I just knew it. No, but listen, remember, when the love of God, if you're committed to walking in love, you're going to be uncomfortable. I was very uncomfortable because I, I, I naturally, back in the day, I really wasn't a person that wanted to confront issues. I'm talking about me. Now, I'm saying this to encourage some people because, you know, you'll say things like, oh, I'm just not really the confrontational type. I really don't want to have to say nothing to no one. I'd rather just not deal with the type, right? Y'all know that type? I was that type. But see, I had to change the way I was thinking. So I was sitting there, and, and the Lord knew I would do it. You know, he knew I was going to say whatever. And, but that didn't mean I wasn't feeling it. You know, I was, I was sweating bullets, you know. I, I mean, I was sweating. And so the girl said, well, what do you think, Dale, about the situation? So, you know, I just looked at her, and I could hear Holy Spirit talking. So I said, hey, listen, you know, I knew she was a believer or Christian, praise the Lord. And, you know, I just told her, I said, hey, what's the word say? You know, what does the word of God say? Because that's what we look to to find out what's right and what's wrong. And so she was just like, you know, well, you know, I mean, I'm a kingdom citizen. And she started blurting out these things. I said, well, hey, listen, the word says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. So what's righteousness? Right living. And we already know from the word, the word says that, you know, anything outside of um, the covenant of marriage is, is sin. So she said, yeah, but you know, uh, you know, he, he's a man. He's going to do what he's going to do. So I just smiled. And then the Holy Spirit told me something. And she said, so he's just going to do what he's going to do. So, you know, I just, and she was proud of it, right? And this is the sad part. She, she was proud of it. So she said, you know, I just, hey, look, I knew he was going to do it. And my gosh, I don't want him to get girl pregnant. So I'm just going to give him some condoms. You know, and so I told her, I said, listen, I said, understand this. I said, remember this. I said, when somebody is outside of the will of God, there is no physical protection against a spiritual enemy. Now, the condom could, be, you know, the condom, yeah, I mean, it could prevent a pregnancy, but it doesn't stop those demons, those other demons that can come into your life. And see, this is where the adversary trick people. I'm just helping out for next week for parenting. <laughs> Setting some stuff up. No, because they're, they're demons that you open yourself up to and you think you're straight, but you ain't straight. And that's how you can get over into pornography and all other kinds of things, all because the door was open. And she was okay with it. So I said, all right. I said, but see, I said what I had to say. And now she came to me months later and she thanked me for what I said, even though at the time she was upset when I said it. But see, I wasn't saying it to her to condemn her. I was saying it to her because I understand that as a sister in Christ, you got to set the example for your child. You say this as well. Mm -hmm. Any door, talking to the parents and those who want to be parents, any door that you're not willing to close in your own life, you leave open for the devil in your child's life. Now, how much do you love your child? 
See, can you, can you stop listening to 95.5? No, I mean, because we all, you know, we got stuff. And we don't want to let go of stuff. And those are idols. And they open up the door to your child. All because you don't want to let go of your past. See, when I think about the demons that were in my life, I say, ain't no way. Ain't no way. And I mean, I listen to whatever all the time. My wife will tell you. We knew each other since we were teenagers, but I ain't play. I'm not saying the stuff didn't sound good because it wouldn't be a temptation if it wasn't. But I'm thinking about my family. And see, it starts with you. See, how much do you love you? The word. You love others as you love yourself. She just looked at me all like I was crazy. I said, I'm just telling you, you can, you can do what you want. But when you get, understand you compromise, you just made a treaty with the adversary when you gave him those condoms. What you should have said to your child was, no. I don't support it, point blank. Now, whatever happens, that's on him, but you should be praying and interceding for your child. See, you can be a shack of love or a house of love. (laughs) Shack of love or a house of love. Let's go to 2 Timothy, the second chapter. 2 Timothy, the second chapter. Because I do want to show you this in scripture so you know that what I gave you was according to the word. 2 Timothy, the second chapter. Let me read this out of the NLT version of the Bible. I'm going to look at verses 24 and 20 through 26. And it says in 24, NLT, it says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Now, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts, and they will learn the truth. Now, watch this. Then they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. So see, if I don't address the error in your thinking, your life ain't changing. See, if all I tell you is, man, it's going to be all right. Bro, it's going to be all right. Sister, it's going to be all right. It ain't going to be all right. You're still going to be in the same condition five years from now if I don't say something to you. You understand what I'm saying? Now, in another translation of the word, it says, in meekness... Okay, it says, in meekness, instruct them. Or in in other words, in meekness, correct them, right? I was looking up this word meekness in the Greek, in the specific translation. And when you look in the Greek, I want you to listen to this, okay? The word meekness, when it says, in meekness, correct them, it means displaying the right blend of force and reserved gentleness. It's displaying the right blend of force And gentleness. Now watch this. Avoiding unnecessary harshness. Without compromising. Without compromising. So see, in meekness, I'm going to be, that's why in some translations you'll see gentleness instead of meekness, or you might see humility. Okay? And to... Another, another um, shade of uh, definition, if you will, is exercising God's strength under his control. So in other words, when I'm meek, when I'm addressing the area you're thinking, when I'm being meek about it, right, I'm exercising enough strength. I'm, I'm under God's control, right? Now, the very fact that I'm exercising strength under God's control, that means God determines how strong I come when I come. You're supposed to be led by the spirit. And see, the word meekness also means teachable. And see, what's happening is every time that you confront someone, and if you listen to Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's teaching you some things. 
because you may not want to do it the way God wants you to do it. You might want to come up, you know, come at them in a strong way. And God say, no, 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 no. This is not the way I want you to do it at all. This is what I need you to do. So we don't determine how we come at people when we come. Because he said in meekness. Now, the very fact that we're, we're doing it under God's control, and I'll say this first so that there's no misunderstanding. The aim in correction in terms of the approach is always gentleness. So let's not misunderstand that. If gentleness was in the aim, gentleness would not be a fruit of our recreated spirit. I mean, that's for the people that want to come at people, you know, just, you know, beat them down, whatever, you know, with that, you know, with that attitude. Gentleness is the aim. However, that does not mean that God's going to lead you that way. Sometimes it requires tough love. Jesus is our example, right? Now, most of the time he was gentle, but there were other times where he just, he came strong. See, like, you can't tell me nothing about the word hypocrite and tell me that's gentle. When Jesus said, you brood of vipers, he said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Now, if he said that to you, you know he'd get offended. He'd be like, all right, I need to go pray in the spirit. Don't tell me that's gentle. There's nothing gentle about the word hypocrite. I don't care how you say it to me. It's, it's just, it's tough. I have to suck it up and I'll be like, okay, all right, Lord, I need some help. So we have to consider, see, the uh, the attitude of the heart is what's most important. See, you got to be willing to, to, to confront and correct however God deems necessary. And that's important because, see, often what we say, and we say this often, is, you know, we'll use the excuse to say, well, that's not my personality. That's not the way I've been wired. And, see, we don't understand that our personality, not all of our personality is God. In other words, your, your history your background, your life experiences have molded and shaped your personality as well. So just because you think you're a certain way, what you got to do is you got to go to God and be like, okay, Lord, is this, really, is this really you or is this just me? Or is this just the product of me being hurt in life? So now I got to bring up this barrier and talk to people any kind of way. And I know people, you know, people say, well, you know, I'm wired like that. Let me tell you something. When you got born again, you got rewired. <laughs> the word of God says that in, the, in, that in us, we have the fullness of the deity. Now, is God love? Yes, he is, right? We know God has the ability to correct, so that means you do, because God is in you. You have the ability to be gentle because God is in you. So now, see, what we fail to do is we hold on to that lie that this is my personality, and we never allow God to develop in that area. Because we keep saying, well, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just an encourager. I, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to run away from confrontation. I don't think it. Stop lying. Stop lying and be real with yourself. You can confront, and you can develop in that area, but you have to allow <laughs> God to do it. And then for, you know, then we got the tough love camp. You know, we got all these camps. And then for the tough love people, I, you know, it's hard for me to be gentle. Stop using the excuse. <laughs> Gentleness is in you because God is in you. His love is in you. What you have to do is go before God and be honest. Lord, I need some help in this area because I understand according to your word is biblically correct to, to confront and correct. I need some help because right now, in this area, gentleness, tough love, whatever, that's kind of hard for me. When I tell y'all that, you know, saying stuff to people and confronting people is hard, I mean, it was hard. Because I always ran from confrontation. Because I didn't want to hurt no one. I'm talking about me, right? I didn't want to offend no one. I mean, I was the typical kind of person that, you know, you'll hear pastors talking about in terms of, you know, not saying what God wanted you to say. But I went to God and I said, okay, Lord, I understand the cost. I know this is not you, so help me develop in this area. How's God going to help you develop? Challenges. <coughs> and then you're going to have to stand on the word. You can't be concerned with what people think about you at all. I 
I just want to give you that one more time before I close out. Listen, <coughs> biblical confrontation. Biblical confrontation and correction is an expression of God's divine love that is essential to our growth process. The purpose is to address the error of a person's thinking that is preventing them from walking in the will of God. The goal of confrontation and correction is repentance. That's my goal. See, where is your attitude? Where is your mindset when you go into this thing? See, think about situations. It could be in your home. It could be in the church, wherever, right? Where is your mindset? Like when I know I'm about to have a conversation with someone that I prefer not to have one, but I need to have it, where is your mindset? Are you thinking about, are you meditating on what they did? Or are you thinking about their deliverance? This is a shift. This is a shift in our thinking because, again, we, we come into this thing like the world. It's hostile. Man, I'm about to blow them up. I'm about to tell them what they did. I'm about to magnify me and tell them all they did to me and how much they hurt me. That ain't God at all. That's your flesh. I ain't stutter. But see, when it's God, Think, just think about it. See, sometimes we read over stuff in Scripture. Think, think about Jesus. Think about all the stuff that people did to him. I mean, seriously, go back. This is your homework assignment for the next time we come together. Go back, look at all the instances where people did things that were offensive. The Word of God says there was no sin in him. But yet and still, all he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He did not look to magnify his pain and his hurt, because he had pain and hurt. He couldn't, have been, he couldn't have been our example if he didn't. But he magnified the Father. He focused on the, on the uh, purpose. He was thinking about repentance. He was thinking about their deliverance. So the whole confrontation and the, and the way he approached correction was totally different. Totally different. Praise the Lord. I'm going to stop. My time's up. I thank you for yours.